Hello. Dear CSS aspirants, welcome to our next lecture on international law. The next topic of today's lecture is, the settlement of international disputes. Let's start with the outline of today's topic. So, first of all we will be discussing, the settlement of international disputes in detail. Then, types of dispute settlement such as, negotiation, mediation, good office, inquiry, conciliation, arbitration, and the last one is, settlement by the United Nations. But in this video, we will be discussing the first type which is, negotiation. Now coming over to our topic which is, the settlement of international disputes. The settlement of international disputes refers to the various methods and mechanisms available for resolving disputes that arise between states in the international system. The methods for the settlement of disputes can be divided into two main categories. Peaceful settlement and enforcement. Let's start with the first category which is peaceful settlement. Peaceful settlement includes methods such as negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. These methods are based on the principle of consent and rely on the cooperation of the parties to the dispute to reach a resolution. These methods are considered as the first line of defense in the peaceful settlement of disputes. Now the second category is Enforcement. Enforcement, on the other hand, refers to the use of coercive measures, such as sanctions or military force, to enforce compliance with international law. These methods are considered as the last resort, and only used when peaceful methods have failed to resolve the dispute. There are several prominent examples of international organizations that are responsible for the settlement of disputes, such as the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and the International Criminal Court. Let's discuss in view of different books. First of all, International Law Malcolm N. Shaw. In his book explains that the peaceful settlement of disputes is a fundamental principle of international law. He provides examples of various methods of peaceful settlement of disputes such as negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. He also mentions that the International Court of Justice ICJ, plays a key role in the peaceful settlement of disputes through its jurisdiction to hear and determine legal disputes between states. Now, the second is Principles of Public International Law by Lan Brown Lai. In his book provides detailed explanations of the various methods of peaceful settlement of disputes such as negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. He also mentions that the International Court of Justice plays a key role in the peaceful settlement of disputes through its jurisdiction to hear and determine legal disputes between states. He also mentions that regional organizations such as the European Union, the Organization of American States, and the African Union also play an important role in the peaceful settlement of disputes. The next book of international law by Dr. S. K. Kapoor. In his book explains that the peaceful settlement of disputes is a fundamental principle of international law. He provides examples of various methods of peaceful settlement of disputes such as negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. He also mentions that the ICJ plays a key role in the peaceful settlement of disputes through its jurisdiction to hear and determine legal disputes between states. He also mentions that regional organizations such as the European Union, the Organization of American States, and the African Union also play an important role in the peaceful settlement of disputes. The last book which is Introduction to International Law by J. G. Stork, QC. In his book provides a comprehensive explanation of the various methods of peaceful settlement of disputes such as negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. He also mentions that the ICJ plays a key role in the peaceful settlement of disputes through its jurisdiction to hear and determine legal disputes between states. He also mentions that regional organizations such as the European Union, the Organization of American States, and the African Union also play an important role in the peaceful settlement of disputes. He also emphasizes on the need for the states to use peaceful means to settle disputes as the use of force is prohibited under international law. Now coming over the types of dispute settlement which includes Negotiation Mediation Good offices Inquiry Conciliation Arbitration 
settlement by the United Nations. The International Court of Justice. Let's start with the first topic which is Negotiation. First of all the introduction. Negotiation is a process in which two or more parties engage in dialogue in order to reach an agreement or resolve a dispute. It is a form of peaceful settlement of disputes and an alternative to the use of force or coercion. Let's see different definitions of negotiation. Negotiation is the process by which two or more parties with different interests and preferences interact, discuss, and communicate to reach an agreement or settlement on a particular issue or dispute. Source, International Law, Cases and Materials, by Laurie F. Damrosh, Sean D. Murphy. Negotiation is a method of dispute resolution in international relations, involving direct or indirect communication between parties to find common ground, address differences, and forge agreements or treaties. Source, International Law, by Malcolm N. Shaw. Negotiation is a diplomatic process in which representatives of states or international organizations engage in discussions, consultations, and exchanges of proposals with the aim of resolving conflicts, clarifying legal positions, or reaching mutually acceptable solutions. Source, International Law, Cases and Commentary, by Philippe R. Webb. Negotiation is an essential tool in international relations, allowing states, international organizations, and non-state actors to engage in dialogue, make compromises, and seek resolutions to complex international issues. Source, International Law, by Antonio Cassis. Negotiation is a dynamic process of give and take, where parties with divergent interests attempt to reconcile their differences and reach mutually beneficial outcomes through communication, persuasion, and compromise. Source, The Oxford Handbook of International Law, edited by Anne Orford and Florian Hoffman. Coming over to the overview of the various types of negotiation. Negotiations can take place in various forms such as Bilateral negotiations Multilateral negotiations Formal negotiations Informal negotiations Direct negotiations Indirect negotiations Let's discuss each type one by one. First of all, bilateral negotiation. Bilateral negotiation refers to a negotiation process that involves two parties or two groups of parties. In this type of negotiation, there are only two sides to the dispute or issue, and the parties directly communicate and interact with each other to reach an agreement or resolution. Now the characteristics of bilateral negotiation are two parties, Bilateral negotiations involve two parties, and the negotiation process is primarily focused on the interests, concerns, and positions of these two parties. Direct communication. The negotiation occurs through direct communication between the two parties, without the involvement of any third-party facilitator or intermediary. Flexibility. Bilateral negotiations offer greater flexibility, as the parties can tailor the negotiation process to their specific needs and preferences. Let's look into some examples of bilateral negotiation. First one bilateral trade agreements. When two countries negotiate trade agreements directly with each other to facilitate the exchange of goods and services between their respective markets. For instance, the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement USMCA, is a bilateral trade agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Second one is border dispute resolutions. When two neighboring countries engage in bilateral negotiations to resolve disputes over their shared borders. An example is the negotiation between India and Bangladesh to resolve territorial disputes along their shared border. Third one is peace treaties. Bilateral negotiations between countries to end conflicts and establish peace. One example is the Camp David Accords, where Egypt and Israel negotiated with the help of the United States to establish a framework for peace between the two nations. Fourth one is defense agreements. When two countries negotiate bilateral defense agreements to strengthen military cooperation and address security concerns. An example is the 1951 Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security between the United States and Japan. Fifth one is economic partnerships. Bilateral negotiations between countries to foster economic cooperation and investment. For instance, Australia and China negotiated a bilateral free trade agreement to enhance economic ties between the two nations. Sixth one is diplomatic discussions. 
when two countries engage in bilateral negotiations to address diplomatic issues, such as consular matters, diplomatic immunity, or the exchange of ambassadors. Seventh example is of cultural and educational agreements. When two countries negotiate bilateral agreements to promote cultural exchanges, academic collaboration, and student exchanges. Eighth one from Pakistan is Pakistan-India Indus Waters Treaty. The Pakistan-India Indus Waters Treaty is an example of successful bilateral negotiation that has contributed to water resource management and cooperation in the South Asian region. Now coming over to the second type of negotiation which is Multilateral negotiation Multilateral negotiation refers to a negotiation process that involves three or more parties. In this type of negotiation, there are multiple sides or groups of parties with varying interests and positions, and they engage in discussions to find common ground and reach a consensus. The characteristics of multilateral negotiation are Multiple parties Multilateral negotiations involve three or more parties, making the negotiation more complex due to the diverse interests and perspectives involved. Complex communication The negotiation process may require more complex communication and coordination, especially when dealing with a larger number of parties. Third-party facilitation In some cases, multilateral negotiations may involve the use of third-party facilitators or mediators to assist in communication and finding common ground. Let's look into some of the examples of multilateral negotiation. Examples of multilateral negotiation are Paris Agreement on Climate Change The Paris Agreement is a multilateral treaty negotiated in 2015 during the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP21, held in Paris, France. It involves representatives from almost all countries in the world. The agreement aims to combat climate change and limit global warming by setting targets for countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and implement measures to adapt to the impacts of climate change. The second one is United Nations Security Council Resolutions. The United Nations Security Council UNSC, is a multilateral body that negotiates and passes resolutions concerning international peace and security. These resolutions are binding on member states and can involve measures such as sanctions, arms embargoes, or peacekeeping operations. Third example is World Trade Organization WTO, negotiations. The WTO is an international organization that deals with the global rules of trade between nations. It conducts multilateral negotiations on various trade-related issues, such as tariff reductions, trade in services, and intellectual property rights. The fourth one is the International Nuclear Agreement, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, is a multilateral agreement negotiated in 2015 between Iran and the P5 plus 1 group of countries, United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China. The agreement aimed to restrict Iran's nuclear program in exchange for sanctions relief. The fifth one is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals (SDGs). The SDGs are a set of 17 global goals adopted by the United Nations General Assembly involving all member states. These goals address various social, economic, and environmental challenges and aim to achieve a sustainable future for all. The sixth one is International Space Treaties. Various multilateral treaties and agreements exist concerning the exploration and use of outer space. For example, the Outer Space Treaty is a multilateral agreement that sets principles for the peaceful use and exploration of outer space. The seventh one is South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation SARC, Summits. SARC is a regional organization comprising eight South Asian countries, including Pakistan. The SARC summits are multilateral meetings where the heads of member states come together to discuss and address issues of regional importance, such as trade, economic cooperation, poverty alleviation, and regional security. Coming over to the next type of negotiation which is Formal negotiation Formal negotiation refers to a structured and organized negotiation process with established rules, procedures, and protocols. This type of negotiation often occurs in professional settings or formal settings where there are specific legal or contractual obligations, and the negotiation process is governed by established norms. The characteristics of formal negotiation are Structure and protocol 
Formal negotiations follow a predefined structure, with specific steps and procedures to be followed by the parties involved. Legal Framework In some cases, formal negotiations are bound by legal frameworks, such as labor negotiations governed by labor laws or international negotiations based on treaties and conventions. Professional Representation Formal negotiations may involve professional negotiators or legal representatives who advocate on behalf of the parties. Let's discuss some examples of formal negotiation. First, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty NPT, review conferences. The NPT is an international treaty aimed at preventing the spread of nuclear weapons and promoting disarmament. Review conferences, held every five years, are formal negotiations where member states discuss the implementation of the treaty's provisions and address issues related to nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The second example is United Nations Climate Change Conferences COP meetings. The COP meetings are formal negotiations under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC. Representatives from almost all countries gather to negotiate and adopt global climate agreements to address climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The third example is World Trade Organization WTO, Ministerial Conferences. Ministerial conferences of the WTO are formal meetings where trade ministers from member countries negotiate and make decisions on trade-related issues, such as tariff reductions, trade facilitation, and dispute settlement. The fourth example is Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions are a set of international treaties governing the treatment of civilians and prisoners of war during armed conflicts. Formal diplomatic negotiations led to the adoption and updating of these conventions, providing legal protections for those affected by armed conflicts. The fifth example is United Nations General Assembly Resolutions. The United Nations General Assembly is a formal diplomatic forum where member states discuss and adopt resolutions on a wide range of issues, including peace and security, human rights, and development. The sixth example is nuclear agreement with Iran, JCPOA. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, is a formal agreement negotiated between Iran and the P5 plus 1 group of countries, United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China, to address concerns over Iran's nuclear program. The negotiations resulted in a comprehensive agreement aimed at restricting Iran's nuclear activities in exchange for sanctions relief. The seventh example is from Pakistan which is Pakistan-Afghanistan talks on bilateral relations. Formal negotiations between Pakistan and Afghanistan to discuss various issues affecting their bilateral relations, such as border security, cross-border trade, and cooperation on counterterrorism effort. TS. These negotiations are conducted at the governmental level and aim to address shared challenges and promote cooperation between the two neighboring countries. Formal negotiations between Pakistan and Afghanistan demonstrate how structured dialogues can be essential in resolving complex issues between nations and promoting understanding and cooperation. Let's see the next type of negotiation which is Informal negotiation Informal negotiation, on the other hand, refers to a more flexible and less structured negotiation process that occurs in informal settings. This type of negotiation is often characterized by a more relaxed and open atmosphere, allowing for creative problem-solving and collaboration. Characteristics of informal negotiation are Flexibility Informal negotiations have a high degree of flexibility, allowing the parties to adapt the process to suit their needs and preferences. Informal settings these negotiations may take place in casual or informal settings, such as informal meetings, networking events, or informal discussions between parties. Direct communication. Informal negotiations typically involve direct communication between the parties without the need for formal documentation or legal frameworks. Let's discuss some examples of informal negotiation. The first one is peace talks between Israel and Palestine. Informal negotiations between Israeli and Palestinian officials have taken place over the years to address the long-standing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. These talks, often facilitated by international mediators, aim to find common ground and potential solutions for issues such as borders, settlements, and the status of Jerusalem. The second is Track 2 Diplomacy. 
Track 2 diplomacy involves unofficial and informal talks between individuals or non-governmental organizations from different countries to discuss sensitive issues or conflicts. These discussions can complement official diplomatic efforts and provide alternative channels for communication and dialogue. The third one is nuclear talks with North Korea. Informal negotiations have been held with North Korea to address concerns over its nuclear program. These informal talks, which sometimes involve former government officials or diplomats, serve as a means to explore potential solutions and build trust between the parties involved. The fourth example is humanitarian negotiations in conflict zones. In conflict zones, humanitarian agencies often engage in informal negotiations with armed groups to ensure access to provide aid and assistance to affected populations. These negotiations are crucial for navigating complex security situations and facilitating humanitarian assistance. The fifth one is climate change informal dialogues. Informal discussions and consultations among countries, non-governmental organizations, and other stakeholders take place during international climate change conferences, such as COP meetings, to explore possible solutions, build consensus, and advance climate actions. The sixth one is back-channel communications in diplomatic relations. In situations where direct official negotiations may not be publicly feasible, informal back-channel communications between countries or diplomats can play a significant role in de-escalating tensions and finding common ground on contentious issues. The example from Pakistan is Track 2 Diplomacy between Pakistan and India. Track 2 diplomacy initiatives involve unofficial, informal talks between non-governmental actors, academics, and former diplomats from Pakistan and India to discuss bilateral issues and explore potential solutions to long-standing disputes, including the Kashmir conflict. These informal dialogues are often held outside formal government channels and aim to foster people-to-people -people contacts, build trust, and promote peaceful relations between the two countries. Now the next type of negotiation is Direct negotiation. Direct negotiation refers to face-to-face -face communication and dialogue between the parties involved in a dispute or negotiation process. In this approach, the parties engage directly with each other, either through formal diplomatic channels or informal dialogues, to discuss the issues at hand, present their positions, and explore potential solutions. Let's see characteristics of direct negotiation. Direct communication. The parties directly communicate with each other without intermediaries or third parties. Direct engagement. The negotiation process involves the direct involvement of representatives or officials authorized to negotiate on behalf of their respective countries or organizations. Real-time interaction. Direct negotiations often involve real-time discussions, meetings, or video conferences, allowing for immediate responses and clarifications. Now coming over to examples of direct communication. First Camp David Accords, 1978. Direct negotiations between Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, Israeli Prime Minister Manekin Begin, and US President Jimmy Carter led to the Camp David Accords, historic peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. The negotiations, hosted at the Camp David Presidential Retreat in the United States, aimed to address the long-standing Arab-Israeli conflict and resulted in the signing of the Accords, which laid the groundwork for peace between Egypt and Israel. The second example is Paris Climate Agreement, 2015. The Paris Agreement is an international treaty negotiated by representatives from almost all countries during the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP21, in Paris, France. The negotiations involve direct discussions between countries to address climate change, set targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and commit to global efforts to limit global warming. The third example is Good Friday Agreement, 1998. The Good Friday Agreement, officially known as the Belfast Agreement, was the result of direct negotiations between the governments of the United Kingdom and Ireland, as well as political parties from Northern Ireland. The agreement aimed to bring an end to the conflict in Northern Ireland and establish a power-sharing government. The fourth one is the Simla Agreement, 1972. This is a prominent example of direct negotiation involving Pakistan. After the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971, direct negotiations took place between Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and Pakistani President Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in Simla, India. The Simla Agreement aimed to resolve the issues arising from the war, 
including the release of prisoners of war and the establishment of a peaceful framework for future relations between the two countries. The fifth one is the Agra Summit, 2001, which is another example of direct negotiation involving Pakistan. Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf and Indian Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee held face-to-face -face talks in Agra, India. The summit aimed to address bilateral issues and promote peace and cooperation between India and Pakistan. Now coming over to the last type of negotiation which is Indirect Negotiation Indirect negotiation, also known as shuttle diplomacy or back-channel diplomacy, involves a third-party mediator or intermediary who facilitates communication between the parties in dispute. Instead of engaging directly with each other, the parties communicate through the intermediary, who relays messages, proposals, and counteroffers between them. Some of the characteristics of indirect negotiation are Third-party involvement a mediator or facilitator acts as a bridge between the parties, carrying messages back and forth. Discrete communication. Indirect negotiations often allow for a more confidential and discrete exchange of information. Separate interactions. The parties do not directly interact with each other but communicate indirectly through the intermediary. Certain examples of indirect negotiations are Iran Nuclear Deal, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, 2015. The negotiations between Iran and the P5 plus 1 group of countries, United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China, were facilitated by the European Union as an intermediary. The EU acted as a coordinator, relaying messages and proposals between the parties during the talks aimed at addressing concerns over Iran's nuclear program. The indirect negotiation process helped bridge gaps and build trust, eventually leading to the signing of the Iran nuclear deal. The Oslo Accords, 1993 The Oslo Accords, which marked the beginning of peace negotiations between Israel and Palestine, were facilitated by Norwegian diplomats. Norwegian officials acted as intermediaries to facilitate secret talks between Israeli and Palestinian representatives in Oslo, Norway. Through indirect negotiations, the parties laid the groundwork for future peace agreements, leading to the establishment of the Palestinian Authority and advancements in the peace process. The Dayton Agreement, 1995 The negotiations that led to the Dayton Agreement, which brought an end to the Bosnian War, involved indirect talks with the assistance of international mediators. Richard Holbrook, the United States Assistant Secretary of State, played a significant role in shuttle diplomacy, shuttling between the parties to mediate and relay proposals. The indirect negotiation process culminated in the signing of the agreement in Dayton, Ohio, USA. The Paris Peace Accords, 1973 The Paris Peace Accords aimed to end the Vietnam War and were negotiated indirectly through the participation of representatives from the United States, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, Viet Cong. Henry Kissinger, the U.S. National Security Advisor, conducted back-channel negotiations with North Vietnamese officials in Paris, with the talks leading to the agreement signing in 1973. The Tashkent Declaration, 1966 This is an example of indirect negotiation involving Pakistan. After the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965, Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin facilitated indirect negotiations between Pakistani President Ayub Khan and Indian Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. The Tashkent Declaration marked the end of hostilities and the establishment of peaceful relations between Pakistan and India. The Doha Agreement, 2020 It is another example of indirect negotiation involving Pakistan. The negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government took place in Doha, Qatar, with the Qatari government acting as a mediator. The talks aimed to find a political solution to the ongoing conflict in Afghanistan, and Pakistan played a crucial role in facilitating the peace process as a regional stakeholder. Over time international law evolved so as the international negotiation. So with this, we are now going to discuss Evolution of international negotiation it is evident from ancient clay tablets that negotiators in the Middle East some 5,000 years ago were negotiating and exchanging treaties. 
In those early times, political and diplomatic negotiations were bilateral meetings between absolute rulers or the councils of city-states, which sometimes negotiated directly, but normally sent their envoys to bargain with the other party. In Renaissance Italy, the city-states not only used special representatives, but also established more or less permanent diplomatic posts in each other's cities. Diplomacy thus became more regulated, and regulations are beneficial for effective negotiation. Diplomacy also slowly but surely became more complex, as more adversaries had to deal with more conflicts between them. The Peace of Westphalia changed the meaning of sovereignty. It was concluded in 1648 through a series of bilateral negotiations in the cities of Munster and Osnabrück, and it declared for the first time that all countries were legally equal. Westphalia is widely seen as the mother of all diplomatic conferences and the beginning of the era of procedural frameworks because it helped to create more effective negotiation processes as an alternative to warfare. 200 years later, the Congress of Vienna, 1814 to 1815, became the first truly multi-party negotiation, although not a fully universal one, as the number of real negotiating parties was kept at five, Russia, Austria, Prussia, Great Britain, and France. Excluded, however, were the other interested countries and parties. They were consulted, but the five did not allow them to be part of the decision-making process. The Paris Peace Conference of 1919 concluded by the Treaty of Versailles that ended the First World War became a major event in the history of diplomacy. As with the Vienna Conference, representatives of hundreds of sovereignties presented their credentials in Paris, but only five were included in the inner circle, the United States, France, Great Britain, Italy, and Japan. Moreover, the negotiation was de facto trilateral, as Japan did not really participate and Italy's role was comparatively weak. The League of Nations, 1919-1946, could be regarded as the first full-fledged multilateral negotiation process. It did some good work in resolving territorial questions after the First World War, but in the security field, it did not live up to expectations. It was only with the San Francisco Conference in 1945, which created the United Nations, that a reasonably effective multilateral diplomatic conference came into existence. Its strong multi-party nucleus, the United Nations Security Council, helped to reduce complexity and enhance efficiency. Now coming over to Challenges in negotiation Challenges in negotiation, in international law refers to the obstacles and complexities that negotiators may encounter while attempting to reach agreements on diplomatic matters. Some of the challenges are Diverse interests Power imbalances Legal complexities Historical context Time constraints Confidentiality concerns Cultural and language barriers Political considerations Public opinion and media scrutiny Implementation and compliance Multilateral complexity Psychological factors Let's briefly discuss each of it Diverse interests in international negotiations, parties often come from diverse cultural, political, and economic backgrounds, and their interests may differ significantly. Bridging these differences can be challenging. Power imbalances Power imbalances among negotiating parties can impact the negotiation process. Stronger parties may attempt to exert undue influence, while weaker parties may struggle to assert their interests effectively. Legal complexities International law is a complex web of treaties, conventions, and customary norms. Understanding and navigating the legal intricacies of relevant agreements can pose challenges for negotiators. Historical context Historical conflicts or unresolved issues between parties can create deep-seated mistrust and hinder productive negotiations. Overcoming historical baggage can be a significant challenge. Time constraints Negotiations often have time constraints, such as impending deadlines or time-sensitive issues. Managing time effectively and reaching agreements within the available time frame can be demanding. Confidentiality concerns. Some international negotiations involve sensitive issues or confidential information. Balancing the need for confidentiality with transparency can present challenges. Cultural and language barriers. Cultural differences and language barriers can hinder effective communication and mutual understanding between negotiators. Political considerations 
Negotiations in international law may be influenced by political considerations at the domestic and international levels, which can complicate the negotiation dynamics. Public opinion and media scrutiny. Negotiations involving high-profile international issues may face scrutiny from the public and media, adding pressure on negotiators. Implementation and compliance. After reaching agreements, ensuring effective implementation and compliance by all parties can be challenging, especially when domestic legal and political systems come into play. Multilateral complexity. In multilateral negotiations involving numerous parties, coordinating interests and finding common ground can be complex. Psychological factors. Negotiations can evoke emotions, egos, and personal biases among negotiators, affecting the decision-making process. With this I come over to conclusion of negotiation. In conclusion, negotiation is a fundamental and intricate aspect of international law and diplomacy. It is a dynamic process that involves parties coming together to resolve conflicts, address differences, and seek mutually acceptable solutions. Negotiation requires effective communication, understanding, and compromise to achieve outcomes that promote peace, stability, and cooperation among nations. Throughout history, negotiation has played a crucial role in addressing a wide range of international issues, from territorial disputes and trade agreements to human rights concerns and environmental challenges. It serves as a mechanism for resolving conflicts peacefully, bridging cultural and political gaps, and fostering productive relationships between states and international organizations. With this, I come over to the end of our today's lecture. I hope you understand the lecture. I would appreciate your feedback by liking and commenting on our videos. Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get updates about our new lectures. Thank you.